Well, welcome to the garden. Worship was powerful. That word about apathy was so on point. Could you feel the room shift? I want to share a story before we get going uh, this morning and get into the message today about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. I had a chance to go in the military in my younger years, and I actually tried to join the Army. That didn't work out. Tried to join the Navy. That didn't work out. The Air Force just looked at me and said, don't even, just keep going. That's true. And uh, I finally landed on the Marine Corps. And uh, I was kind of resisting going in the Marines because I grew up in a Marine Corps town. Grew up in Camp Lejeune, Jacksonville, North Carolina, home of like 70, 100,000 Marines. And before I knew Jesus, back in my wild days, I was known, maybe have been known to get in a fight or two with Marines. So it's the last thing that I wanted to do. But I ended up knowing I had to change my life where I was at at that point. So I started the process of joining the Marines. Went through the whole process, and one of the the things that I remember that stood out is you have to take a test. Now, I think this is true for anyone in the military, and the test was called the ASFAB, the ASFAB test. And this test, I've I've taken the SAT. This test was, it would put the SAT to shame. It literally took me, if I can remember right, almost five hours. It was like a half a day to take this test, and they tested you on everything. I mean everything, not just math and English. I mean everything about life, common sense. And the reason they administer the military gives that test is because that test is going to determine what your occupation is going to be in the military. So if you do really good on the test, guess what? You're going to have a lot of options to choose from in what you want to do. But if you don't do well on the test, your options are not going to be so big. They're actually going to be really, really small. And there's a certain job most military guys, not all, but most, uh, did not want to do, but it required hardly anything to get on the test. You could pretty much fail it, and that was infantry. That's going to war, training for war. Well, day came, I took that test, and it was so hard, so long, but I actually felt really good about it. I felt that I did well. Well, after they processed the test, I go to my recruiter, and when I walked into his office, I was kind of excited. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm going to have a list of options to choose from. Maybe I'll go in Intel, Marine Marine Reconnaissance Intelligence, Counterintelligence. That was one of the jobs. Had several. And so when I went to him that day, he said, yeah, that's not going to happen. He said, you didn't do too well. He said, in fact, there's only two jobs you can choose from according to your test scores. He said, you can go to Motor T and be a mechanic or you can go in the infantry. I said, man, I'm a mechanic. That's just, I'm not a mechanic. So I chose infantry, and I went into infantry. But I'm so glad I did, because I ended up meeting some really good guys along the way. Well, what is the point of all that? That test was very important. You know why? Because it determined my future. It determined the next chapter of my life. And so I want to talk about this morning the biggest test that Jesus, our Lord, ever had to go through. And it was the test at the Garden of Gethsemane. How many have read that passage before? We're going to get into it this morning. So let's go in our Bibles. Let's go to Mark 14. Mark 14, and we're going to read about this test of tests that Jesus actually has to go through. As you're turning there, when I was preparing this message, I really sensed the Lord give me a clear word about what type of season we're in, not just the Garden Greenville, but the body of Christ at large. And this is what I heard the Lord say. He said, the church has entered into a testing period. In fact, I believe many in this room are going through some type of test. You may be tested in a financial way. You may be tested in a marriage way. You may be tested in a relationship way. There may be a job tested. There's there's some form of testing that you are currently going through that you are engaged in. And what I want to just encourage us with this morning is that When we walk with the Lord, we're obviously going to go through some tests. But what I've learned is that some tests are different than others. And so the test of Gethsemane is actually, it's one of the tests that we all have to go through. And um, it is, it requires everything in terms of surrender. You know, in Genesis uh, 22, we read the story of Abraham offering Isaac. That was a Gethsemane type test. We read it again in David's life in Samuel when he's at Ziglag. The enemy comes, destroys 
all the town, take the people out, the women and the children. The men, his own men were ready to stone him. That was a big test on David's life. It was a Gethsemane test. So here we read in the Gospels, Jesus, right before the crucifixion, goes to this place, the Garden of Gethsemane, and has to endure one of the greatest tests of his life while he was here on earth. And I believe many of us are in that test right now. I believe many in this room are in a Gethsemane test. And what I've learned about tests, it's really important how we respond to the test that God places in because it determines our next season. It determines our future. It determines the next chapter of our lives. And so how we respond when we're being tested is critical. So we're gonna look at some of these things and unpack them. All right, Mark 14, let's go, 32. It says, and they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began... He began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. But stay here and keep watch. Now going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if the possible that the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Yet not I, what I will but what you will. And then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And once more he went away and he prayed the same thing. He came back again. He found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. And returning To the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting enough? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go, for here comes my betrayer. What a story. This is the hardest test in Jesus' life. A few things I want to note here before we start unpacking this. The first note I want to point out is Gethsemane. Gethsemane in the Greek actually means the olive press. It's the place of crushing, of pressing. And it's where olives, olives in Israel, in Jerusalem, it's where the olives are actually turned into olive oil. And I shared this with the kids last week. Do you guys know that the olive tree is eternal? Given in the right environment, it never dies. So right now, at the Garden of Gethsemane site in Israel, in Jerusalem, the same olive trees that were there when Jesus was there are the same ones that are there today. Unbelievable. But that's not the point why I'm bringing that up. Here's what I'm going to bring. I want to pass this along. This is a study note. Anytime you read of a place in the Bible like this text we just read, you want to pay attention because places in the Bible represent places that we go in God with. Places in the Bible actually represent places you and I actually go in God with. So Gethsemane, when we look at it from this perspective, is actually a model. It's a prototype. It's a pattern, if you will, of what suffering and going through hardships and testing will look like for us. And it also gives us a study sheet, if you will, of how to pass some of the most difficult tests that we have to go through, right? And so that's really, really interesting. The other point I want to bring out is this. Jesus was battling going to the cross. He's fully God but he's also fully man. But could you hear him in that? Could you hear him in that passage? He's saying, Father, he's essentially saying, Father, I love you deeply. I am committed to you. I am going to obey you. I'm going to follow you no matter what. But man, is there another way we can do this? Is there another way we can fulfill this mission without me having to go through that? is there another way I can do this? There's got to be another way. This is the wrestle. This is what's going on in the mind of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. He's wrestling. Man, is there there a way? He knows he's called to be faithful to the Father and he's going to obey him, but it's the process. It's the how. It's the journey. It's the testing that he's really struggling with yielding to. Can anybody resonate with that? 
Because if you have followed God for a certain length in your life, you know that he leads you to tests and challenges that are not pleasant, are they? Matter of fact, they're very difficult. Have you ever been in that situation where you said, God, is there any other way? God, there has to be another way. Is there any other way? Right? He's, he's wrestling uh, those places. Uh, and, and the reality is, what did the Father say to Jesus' request? He said nothing. He was silent. We don't see the Father answer his son in this moment. Why? Because a lot of times when we're in the Gethsemane-type test, he's going to be silent. He's not even, it's not even going to feel like he's there. Why? Why does he do that? Why does that happen? Because that's when we have to find strength when there's no strength to find. We have to be in such of a place where no matter what, I'm going to follow through. So I think that is really, really important to remember. Jesus, you know, this, this thing, how the Lord tests us, it's really important to talk about. <clears throat> you know, because some tests are different in our life. Not every test is the Gethsemane test. Some are different. You know, there may be some test that's on a certain level over here where the Lord may give you a hard word to share with somebody, and you know it's going to be difficult, but he tests you. Will you be obedient to deliver that word, to carry it out, right? I'm sure some of us have been in that situation, a lot of us. There's another way. There's a financial way. Sometimes the Lord will put you in a place where you got to sow a seed or you have to give an offering in order to be obedient and follow out what he's calling you to do. Matter of fact, on that note, uh, there was one time where the Lord really tested Amber and I strongly in this one. I'll never forget it. We were students at Regent at school and we were both working part-time, both in college full-time. Money was like not there. And I remember we got a loan back one time and there was a little extra on the loan and it basically gave us $1,000. And that $1,000 is what we were gonna live off for the next couple months. And so back then to us, that $1,000 might have well been fifteen dollars or $20,000. I mean, it was like everything for us to live off of. Small babies, we're in school, we're working, right? Well, I have a friend at the same time at the university. He works in the upper level of the administrative office him and his wife have a couple kids, and they're pregnant with their fourth. And we knew them pretty well. And I remember right about this time that we got that refund back, she has complications with the baby. And it's actually it's a sad story. The baby ends up dying at birth and is stillborn. Uh, it was tragic. It was crushing for the couple, for a lot of us in the community, because we all stayed in the same marriage housing apartment complex. It was tough all the way around. Went to the funeral. The, the service was it, was, it was a heart wrencher, tear gusher. And my friend, whose name was Clay, was just so broken. And they had already were in process of buying a house to move into when the new baby came. So after they got through the funeral, they were going to move, and he needed some help moving. And I remember right before I went over to help him move, I was taking a walk around the campus, and I heard the Lord talk to me. And you know what he said? He said, Michael, I want you to give your and Amber's $1,000 to Clay. I said, huh? Lord, I love this brother. I can't, I can't imagine what they're going through, but are you, am I hearing you right? And you start, you start talking to the Lord. You start like, is this me? Is this you? Y'all been there. You know what I'm talking about. And, I, and I, as I walked, the more I couldn't stop thinking about it. Couldn't shake it. I knew we had to do it. So I talked to Amber. She was actually in agreement. And so the day went, came, I helped them move. And I left $1,000 in an envelope and gave it to him as I walked out. Well, the next day, Clay called me and just was blown away. He was, he was beside himself. He said, please, let me take you out to lunch. So I met him for lunch, and we sat down. We began to talk. Man. You know, he said, uh, after the baby died, I've been really struggling if God is even real. I've been struggling if he's even, even real. And so I asked him, if you really are real and you've not left us, you have to give us a miracle, something that's unordinary for me to believe you. He says, so when you gave that $1,000, me and my wife wept because it was the sign we were praying for that God was still with us. So this is where the story gets actually really good. 
because we're both crying. It's the Lord all the way around. But the Lord wasn't done yet. So two months later, we are now, this is great, but we're in a financial bind because we've given everything we have. And we need a minivan because we're having babies like Adam and Eve in the garden. They're just two and three are coming out. I mean, we're just having babies all the way. We have three kids. We're having our, pregnant with our third in so many years. You know, Amber was pregnant for almost 10 years in a row, it seems like. That's, that was a lot of diapers. And we had this little jet, jet, Volkswagen Jetta car. You know, we're packed in tight. We need a minivan. Broke me down. I didn't want a minivan. So we found a minivan on Craigslist for $5,000, one of the Ford Windstars. I don't know if you guys remember that. It might be a little showing my age right here. That was an old school minivan. But it's the only one we could afford. We found it on Craigslist, $5,000. We don't even have $100 to put towards it. So about that time, I get a call. Guess who's it from? It's from my friend Clay. Turns out Clay was part of a committee who interviewed students who petition for grants and scholarships and they take a group of students and they pick one and they give a scholarship to. When he saw my name among the list of several students, he goes, I think we need to give this grant scholarship to Michael. So they gave me, and it was actually $5,000 paid for our minivan. So what is the point? Do you see that? That test determined a lot of things, but here's what I want you to understand. The test didn't just impact me but it impacted the people around me. So the tests you're in right now are not just determining your future, but it could also determine the people around you's future. All right? So that's why it's really, really important to think about this and to, and to lean in on it. But here's something about this story that always gets me in the Garden of Gethsemane. The big part of this is this. When we read through that, did you guys catch it? Jesus makes that statement, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. How many times did he pray that? Did you catch it? He went back and said it how many times? Three times. And I've always wondered, Jesus, why did you pray that three times? Why did you have that wrestle? What was, what was that all about? Three times you prayed this. And one day the Lord began to speak to me. You know what he said? He said, Michael, he said, you know, we are a trinity. We are a triune being, God the Father, God the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And he said, you, I made you in my image. And you, being humanity, are also tripart beings. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, we are made up of mind, body, soul. Mind, heart, flesh, body. And what God began to show me, Jesus said, I was actually modeling what full surrender looks like. It's a surrender of the mind and when I say mind, I mean beliefs. But not only that, it's a surrender of the heart, and the two are different. Because you can be surrendered here, but not here. They honor me with the words, but their hearts are far from me. And our bodies have to also be surrendered. And so the Lord began to open it up. He said, there's not really a proper conception of what surrender is. And I want to actually help my church see the full picture of what full surrender looks like. Because here's the deal, guys. To go through a Gethsemane test in our life, and you will go through one of those tests. If you continue to follow Jesus, you will go through that test. But here's what I want to tell you. The only way through that test is a wholehearted full surrender. Some tests you can give your way out. Some tests you can pray your way out. And some tests you can only trust your way out. Jesus had to completely trust the process and the process that God had made for him to go through in order to pass this test. Man, I don't know about you, but I think that's powerful. So I know we won't get all of it to today, but here's the three things I want to talk about. Full surrender is we surrender our beliefs, we surrender our heart, and we surrender our bodies. And when I say bodies, I mean our behaviors have to be surrendered. I find that for wholehearted surrender to take place in our life, all three have to be surrendered. So let's talk about this first one a little bit. Surrendering our beliefs. We have a slide of that. Surrendering our beliefs. A surrender of the mind is a surrender of our belief systems. I'm going to say that again. A surrender of the mind 
is a surrender of our belief systems. I have two verses up here. Let's, could we put up Matthew 4, 17? Isn't it interesting that when Jesus comes on the scene, John actually precedes him, and the whole message of John the Baptist was one message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus starts his ministry, it doesn't start with the Sermon on the Mount. He gets there, he develops that, he teaches that, but his proclamation actually starts with this message. And that message is what? For Jesus said and preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so we know that that Greek word metanoia, repent, actually means to what? Change the way we think. Change the way we believe. See, in essence, remember, 400 years of silence in the Bible. So this proclamation, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, O Israel, you have to begin to rethink what you think you know about God. You have to begin to rethink what you think you know about salvation. you got to be, begin to rethink what you think you know about worship and about holiness and about living. You need to begin to rethink and reimagine. Because the reality is a lot of the belief systems in Israel at this time, it's not so much that they were wrong, it's so much that they became outdated. They became outdated. I'm not talking about like the core fundamental truths, anchor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the belief system. Some of the belief systems became outdated. And for them to move forward with the kingdom, they begin to have to grow here. Their mindsets have to grow. Their thinking has to go higher. So when Jesus is saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he's basically saying, look, you need to begin to change the way you think about some things. May have worked for you in the past, but we're in a time now where that's not going to work. So you're going to have to begin to change the way you process, the way you think in order to follow me at a higher level. And I'm going to tell you right now, that's hard. Is that not challenging for some of us who are a little bit older? It's hard, it's, it's, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks is what they say. That's true. But that is the whole message. Now, look, Paul agrees with this in Romans 12 too. Look what he says. Look what Paul says. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your heart. Oh, of your what? Your mind. Write this down. Transformation, which is the goal for all of us, transformation does not come when we surrender our hearts. Transformation comes when we surrender our beliefs. Transformation comes when we surrender our mindsets and what we believe about certain things. See, there's a part that we get to play in this, and God plays. God plays a part in our life, in your life, and we play a part for God to move in our lives. And our part is this. Notice, Jesus didn't say repent. He didn't say change your heart for the kingdom of heaven. He said change the way you think for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change the way you think. The renewing of how you think is actually going to be able to transform this thing right here. Listen to me. This is how this works. When we begin to surrender what we think is true, what we think and what we believe in our belief systems, when we begin to surrender that in the spirit, in the spiritual realm, something extraordinary happens. There is a window that opens in the spirit realm. There's an opportunity that happens. And you know what that is? That opportunity actually gives the Father an opportunity to give your life grace, mercy, his presence, and it comes right here. Many of us struggle. We know God here, but we don't know him here. I got it here, but I don't experience it here. Perhaps it's because there's some outdated belief systems that need to be surrendered. Perhaps there's some outdated views that need to be laid down at the altar, which requires humility to actually even accept the fact I may not be in far along in God as what I thought I was. It's humility. But when we get to that place and we begin to surrender our beliefs, our, 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 our minds to him, it actually gives him grace to do work right here in this heart. Because listen to me, guys, there's a work that only the Spirit of God can do in your heart. Now, there's not a man that can do it. There's not a teacher that can do it. There's not a person that can do it. There are some things only the Spirit of God can do in the heart of a human being. That's what the Bible says. 
But what I'm saying is when we begin to surrender our belief system, it actually helps expedite that process. Give a few examples. When I was, the day before I went to rehab, or the day of I went to rehab, my dad had me loaded in a car with a trash bag of dirty clothes. He was gunning it to the rehab shelter. I'd smoked crack for two nights before. I was so cracked out on crack cocaine. And for 10 years, basically, I lived my life as a lie. Lying and cussing like crazy were second nature. And I had an agreement with this recovery. They said, you can't use for 72 hours in order to be admitted. Well, the fact is, I just used six hours ago. And my dad's on the way. It's 8 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. So he drives off, and as soon as he hits the property, he opens the door and says, get out. Phew, and he just hightails out. Because he's like, if you don't get in, I'm not taking you back. That's kind of where my life was. So I walked into the office, and this guy, his name was David Hill. I still thank God for this man. He was in the office, and he's kind of a hard guy. And he sat behind the desk, and we sat down, and, you know, he was an addict himself, so he knew everything. He looks at me, and he goes, well, I'm going to ask you one question. He said, and you better not lie to me. He said, because if you lie to me, I have the power to not let you into this rehab, even though we have a bed for you, and you start walking down the road. Mind you, this is 70, this is like 70 minutes from anything. It's like in the country. And as soon as I leaned in, he goes, have you used in the last 72 hours? And I mean, as quick as he said it, it was coming out of my tongue. Absolutely not. No, it's just... Why? Because in my mind, it's second nature to lie as an addict. And as soon as I went to go, absolutely not. It's like my tongue stopped. I couldn't do it. And I looked and I sank because I knew when I told him the truth, I, I really thought I'm being kicked out. And this is it. I mean, I'm, my life's on the line. I'm going to probably kill myself. Like, I'm in that state. And I said, no, the truth is I used six hours ago, and I've used this whole weekend. I've done everything. I told him, I was first time in 10 years, a decade of my life, I was honest. And he leaned back and he said, dang. He said, everything you just told me, I got the power not to let you in. He said, but you told the truth. So I'm going to let you in. And it wasn't four or five days later that I was walking on that dirt road, just as depressed and as down as you could ever think or imagine, when all of a sudden, Right here, I began to feel the hammer of God break the hardest places of my heart. And I, not in a Bible study, not in a message, not, not, and I began to cry on that dirt road. What was happening? I gave God an opportunity when I surrendered my beliefs about lying, when I surrendered my concept, everything I believed for 10 years, when I began to surrender my beliefs, it gave God a window of opportunity for his grace and his presence to begin to work in the hard places of my heart. And I began to experience him. Does that make sense? So again, I want to, I want to re reiterate that we are transformed, not by so much surrendering our hearts, but it's happened when we surrender our beliefs. Last few minutes before we end, I have a quote. Man, this is so good. Let's talk about beliefs for a few minutes before we end. We went to the garden retreat. Who went to the garden retreat? Unbelievable. One of the books that really helped us was called The Garden Within. We actually have it in the desk out there. And that was written by a lady named Dr. Phillips. And she has some insight on beliefs. When I talk about surrendering beliefs, Jesus surrendering his beliefs at that time about the process in Gethsemane, Look at what Dr. Phillips says. I think this is powerful. She goes, the words we hear become the truth we believe. Let that sink in for a moment. That even shows us how our belief systems can get messed up, how they could actually become corrupted. Because, right, what we hear a lot will actually start to make a belief system out of it, even if it's true or not true. That lets us know that if our truth is not founded on the word, basically our feelings and our emotions can make up our belief systems that it's all rooted in that, and that could lead us astray. This shapes our beliefs, but look at this. A belief is different than a fact. Facts are visible, measurable, and are objective. A belief is the acceptance of a truth. Do you see the difference? Right? George Washington was the first president of the United States. That is a fact. We had a civil war in this country. That is a fact. It's measurable. It's visible. It's objective, but 
But a belief is more subjective. It's about accepting the truth. It's about accepting a certain reality or the validity of something. This is the difference. Facts don't require faith, but beliefs do, right? And so that is something that you want to really think about. Because when we, when I say belief system, when we, we surrender belief systems, it's things that may be out of order or out of line or outdated. It's actually hindering us. It's harming us. But if we can get to the place where Jesus did in Gethsemane and we begin to take our opinion out of what our process should look like, I say that again. When we take our opinion out of what the process should look like, then we begin to move in this Jesus-like surrender to the Father. Ultimately, Jesus had to surrender his mind at Gethsemane because at Gethsemane, in his mind, he was crucified. He was crucified in his mind first at Gethsemane before he was crucified on the tree with his body. How many know that there's nothing more powerful than a made-up mind? When you actually make up your mind and you settle it here, there is so much power, there's so much energy, there's so much courage and boldness that comes from that. When you actually have the ability to, to make up your mind and settle something, I mean, it's, it's huge. It's, it, it is huge. I mean, even think about it, because I believe this is what's happening. I believe many of us are saying, Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart. But the Lord is saying, well, I want to work in your heart, but I got to have your mind first. I got to have your beliefs first. I have to have you fully surrendered here so that I can do the work in here. Are you with me this morning? All right. This is that test. This is a test of surrendering what we think we know and laying it down in order to receive what he's saying now, his truth. That's, that's just so powerful to me. So powerful. Um, here's a question I want to ask, and here's the question. How, how can you discern when some of your beliefs are outdated? How do you discern it? How can you tell when something you believe or have believed for a while that may have been true for a season, but it's actually hindering you now? How do you actually know that? There's a couple of answers, but for the sake of time, there's really one that sticks out for me and what I've learned over the years. You know what it is? It's when you get stuck. The moment you become self-aware that you become stuck spiritually, apathetic, the moment you wear that, the chances are the indicator is that there's some belief systems that are outdated here that are preventing you from moving forward. And so you want to be able to understand that and take that to the Lord and surrender it, right? So that is, that is really, really good to know. So again, be surrendered. All right, let's end here. I have a study guide. I call it a study guide because we got to pass this test. Here's just a few practical things to help us pass the test. Be open-minded. Be open-minded. We, we want to have an open mind. In a time of testing, in a time of testing, a lot of times it's hard. We, we actually misinterpret the direction of God in our life in a time of testing. That opportunity to misinterpret what he's, where he's leading us is very real, Right? We also, it's also, I've learned when I'm tested like this, I have, the, I have an ability, there's an ability there to miss and, and judge what other people are saying. My filters are up or my walls are up, so I'm not really hearing clearly what other people are saying because I'm in a time of testing. So I want to be open-minded to what other people are saying that love me, that, that I trust. I want to have an open mind. See, if we're walled up, if we're closed, if we're like, nope, this is it and that's it, I'm not hearing it, a lot of times we're not going to pass that test. Look at Israel, 40 years. They could have made that desert trip in 40 days. It took them 40 years because they were not open-minded. They weren't willing to be uh, teachable and actually learn something new that could have helped them. It's prayer. Speak less and listen more. In a time of testing, I like to get quiet. I like to get in silence and solitude. I, I like to just shut everything down. Because here's why, guys, listen, in a time of testing, the enemy rages. The enemy rages. So we all go through opportunities in life to be offended. Can I get an amen? Some will happen today. But there are certain times in our life where the ability to be offended is actually heightened more than others. So in a time when you're tested, when you can understand you're in a test, there's a heightened sense, there's a heightened 
probability of you being offended at all areas and all angles. So it's very important for you to be still. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. You want to be able to observe not only what the Father's doing, but the attack or the traps that are before you. And, and you can't do that in a hurry. You can't do that 100 miles an hour. You have to quiet your soul. You have to bring your mind in alignment with your heart and alignment with your body and your posture. Don't take the bait of offense. Man, do not take that bait. And lastly, we actually said this earlier, remembering and recalling what God did in the past. Man, that's helped me so much. When I remember and recall what the Lord did in the past, it really shifts my focus off me, puts it back on him. And I find a strength in God to get me through that test. And that's very important. So obviously we are out of time. Perhaps we'll continue on with this and talking about what it looks like to surrender our hearts, because that's even different, and then surrendering our behaviors, our bodies to the Lord. Because I don't know about you, but I want to walk in full-hearted surrender. Does anybody want to walk in that way? Will you stand with me this morning? I actually just want to just sit right here and take a moment. And, uh, and let's just take a moment of silence, actually. And I want you just, whatever you're walking through, whatever level of testing you're in right now, maybe there's something you need to surrender. Maybe it's a person, a situation, family member. Let him show you whatever it is. And let's just take a moment of silence. Let him speak to you. And then I want you to surrender that to him. Jesus, you can have it all. All of it's yours. We surrender our minds and our beliefs to you. I pray that you would speak to everyone in this room, everyone listening online, that you would begin to speak to them this week that you would prompt them, that you would move on their lives of some things that need to be let go of. I pray for your grace and your peace just to hit. The Lord is showing me right now, there's some marriages in this room that are under attack. There's some marriages in this room that are hanging on by a thread. There's been so much destruction. You've lived in Gethsemane for years. And I just hear the Lord saying so softly, don't give up. Father, I pray right now that you would bless everyone here with the courage to lay down pride, 
with the courage to lay down any level of self-dependence, self-sufficiency, any, any level of selfish desires that we have. I, I pray that you would give us the courage to lay that down, to lay down our reputations, egos, to lay down all of it so that we can walk where you are leading us to walk in this season and in this chapter of our lives. I bless the Garden Greenville with that courage today and everyone listening online. So, Father, we thank you and we bless you. We pray over this week that you would move mightily through every home, every person. On, uh, uh, as we take spring break in schools, families, I pray for incredible rest. I pray for incredible downtime. Father, I pray for just resetting, for just recalibrating. I pray all of those things begin to happen so that we are completely aligned this week with you and what you're saying over our lives. We absolutely love you, Father. There is no one like you. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us a model of what it looks like to endure some of the hardest tests that we have to walk through. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.